Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, we are going to have, I think there were almost 300 of you waiting before we came in. So it's going to take a minute to get everybody in. Um, but if you'd like, you can go ahead and start putting in the, in the chat, uh, just hellos and where you're from and who, who we've got here. It'd be great to know, um, who's here. Um, the chat should be set up so that um, everybody can see what everyone else is putting in the chat. And um, if we need to, we might put in um, other links or resources in the chat as well. Oh, great. I see people are starting to say hello, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm going to wait just a little bit longer. For the folks like me who are like always late. It's not so bad at work, but uh, my friends say that I run on an easy standard time, which is 10 to 15 minutes later than everyone else, which is probably true. Um, fortunately, Jason on my team runs on Jason's standard time, which is uh, even a little bit later. Right, Jason? <laughs> It's an unpredictable amount of time before or after. The time. Right. <laughs> That's true. And we both used to drive our old boss absolutely insane because he was always on time, but not always prepared. So I told him I was always late, but usually prepared. So it kind of balanced out. All righty. So I'm seeing a bunch of folks saying, hey, in the, in the um, chat, love it. Um, Please go ahead and do that if you haven't already. Um, really happy to see so many people here. So um, today's webinar is um, intended, the primary audience of today's webinar is um, for new grantees. But we know that there's, uh, there's turnover a lot of times at housing authorities. And so there may be people working on an F grant that um, the grant has been going for a while, but maybe you are newer. Um, to the FSS program. We're also hoping that we have um, some senior staff as well as frontline staff uh, who are on. And um, we certainly have a good cross section, I'm sure, between public housing and um, PBRA. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and let's, Michelle, can we launch that poll just to see who's here? So just two questions and just pick the, the um, answer that's sort of best for you. Um, on the how long have you worked with FSS, um, mostly what I'm looking for here is have you only ever been functioning under the new rules, which were published in June of 2022 and had to be fully implemented by um, November of 2022? Um, or were you around before the new rules and went through that tr transition? And then the a while is, um, you know, like, yeah, I've been here five, six, 20, 30 years. Um, something that's kind of, you kind of feel like a little bit of a veteran. Awesome. We'll leave that open for... Um, a little bit longer. And then also I just want to invite you, um, if you already have questions, um, you can feel free to go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Uh, we won't be looking at the chat for questions. We'll be looking at the Q&A for questions. Um, we will also like feel free to put the questions in the Q&A as we go along. If there are things that, you know, questions come up as we're talking and then we will have time for questions at the end as well. Um, and we'll do our best to kind of, um, the different speakers will be, um, won't necessarily be looking at the Q and A, but the other speakers will be. So we'll, um, you know, might jump in with each other and just say, oh, here's a question. And can you say a little bit more about X or Y? So I think we're, Good. I think, Michelle, let's go ahead and close the poll. Let's see what we got. 
All right. So most folks are from PHAs, which is um, makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. We have a lot more PHAs in the program than PBRA owners. Um, very curious about the someplace else. If you put someplace else, not a PHA or not a PBRA owner, um, would you put in the chat where you're from? Um, maybe you're in an industry group or something like that. So um, just curious. And then great. All right. So about half of you are just starting out, kind of have no, not very much knowledge at all. Um, and then another bunch are fairly new. Um, and then recently, and then um, and then we do have about a third of folks have been around a while. So may not be anything exciting or new for you all, but maybe, you know, the, there's always um, tweaks and changes and, and you can always learn um, a little bit more. So great. All right. Well, before we really get into things, um, I would love to welcome Marianne Nazaro, who is our Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Public and Housing Investments. And the Office of Public Ho and Housing Investments um, contains um, the Special uh, Application Center, the MTW Office, the um, Choice Neighborhoods Office, the Capital Fund, um, the uh, Office of um, who am I missing besides CSS? Mixed finance. Mixed finance. That's, I was like, I know. It's like, uh, where? <laughs> I'm like counting on my fingers while you're I know. Them. Where is Sue and Belinda and uh, Tess? Yeah, the mixed finance office. And then, of course, the community and supportive services team. And our community and supportive services team um, covers FSS and Ross and Jobs Plus and HUD Strong Families and um, Connect Home and a bunch of other um, stuff like that. So Marianne is the uh, fearless leader of all of us, and um, she wanted to come and uh, say hello and welcome you all. So I'll turn it over to Marianne. Awesome. Thanks, Anisi, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today and to join you and to really congratulate you on starting off your new FSS programs. Um, that was a really great uh, survey to start with to get an idea of who's in the room, how much um, experience we have, and I was really excited to see a lot of new grantees as well. So, uh, so welcome aboard. As Anisi said, I'm Marian Nazaro, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Housing Investments, and really want to say a huge thank you to Anisi and Jason and the entire FSS team for all of the really great work that they've done in um, getting this just today's webinar together, together, reviewing the applications, getting everything through. We're just really excited to have you all on board. Um, HUD has long recognized the need to support residents' financial growth, and particularly with the FSS program. I will say FSS is the largest asset building program in the entire country for low-income families. And so we are really thrilled to have you join and be a part of that family. So thank you. Um, the last couple of years, we've been partnering even more with our colleagues in multifamily housing to spread FSS to uh, the PBRA residents across the country. I think I saw about 20 of the PBRA um, sites are on board. So welcome aboard, welcome to FSS. Uh, between this year and last year, we have funded 91 new PBRA programs. So that is great. And we were able to make that expansion to the PBRA platform, thanks to you, right? So since 2015, you all have been saying, like, let us in, please let us be a part of FSS starting in 2015. Congress said, sure, come on in. Um, and it wasn't until 2018 that real Congress really enabled us to reauthorize the entire program so you all can fully engage and be a part of the program. So we are really glad that you're here. And of course, welcome to our PHAs. Um, you're our bread and butter here in PIH. And so we are so thankful to you and all the work that you do to support the families in your communities. Um, this year, 
we have funded more grants than we ever have before. Um, and even so, we have almost 150 applicants that applied for FSS that were not able to get funded. Um, so we know there's a need out there. We know that you guys were happy that you guys were here and we really wish that we were able to uh, support the full need for the FSS program. This is a really big step um, to ensure that HUD assisted families have equal access to invest in their own financial futures. When we think of FSS, we think about financial security and the opportunity for families to save. And our vision for this, this is our vision for this work as we continue it and as we expand it going forward. We serve millions of renters, the vast majority of whom are not connected to services or asset building programs. So we're really, um, appreciative to be able to have this opportunity through FSS to be able to do that. And we truly believe that regardless of how much money somebody makes, where they live, whether or not they receive housing assistance, everybody in the country deserves to have that sense of security for their families that is involved with that consistent savings that families are able to achieve through FSS. So I'd just like to take a moment and just talk outcomes and what have we done just within the last year alone. Over 70,000 families participated in FSS at over at around over 900 agencies and PHAs, as well as 125 multifamily properties. So that is a lot of families that we're assisting. The graduates of FSS graduated with approximately $9,000 in savings, which is a pretty significant amount of money. Um, and 30% of those left housing assistance within a year of finishing the program. Again, I'm gonna say this again, 30% of the families that participated in FSS were able to leave housing assistance without within a year of graduating the program. That is huge. So um, that's really a remarkable accomplishment and thanks in part to the great work that you guys are going to be doing. Um, as you all know, in 2022, we updated our regulations to allow even more flexibility um, and hopefully reduce the challenges for the participating families. We are excited that we have just launched our first ever national qualitative annual report survey to gather information from our grantees about how they about how you are choosing to implement the programs. And so take a look um, for that. Uh, we're gonna be publishing a report to Congress later this year. And I think you'll find a lot to learn from that. So once again, welcome to the FSS community. Uh, we are so glad to have you here and thank you so much every, for all of the work that you and your teams do every single day to support the families in your communities. And with that, Anisi, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Marianne. Really appreciate your time. I know you've got a lot managing all those all those offices. We've got over a hundred staff now, I think, right? And um, in yep. OPHI, which is amazing because really not that long ago, we were around 60, 70 for a long time. And we've really had a lot of investment in all of our um, programs and in, in innovations, which has been very exciting. So um, really uh, appreciate your time. And I know you've got to run, but um, thanks. And, and also thanks for your um, long-term support uh, of the FSS program. Um, little secret, Marianne and I came into HUD together as President Management Fellows 21 years ago. So it's been exciting to wow. be around and watch um, these programs grow as we grew up, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, All right. Thanks, Nate. Congratulations, everybody. Welcome aboard. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Um, all right. So the very first thing uh, that we want to do is to encourage you, if you have not already, to join the FSS mailing list. Um, the oh, I'll also answer a couple of questions. So the um, this webinar is for public housing agencies and um, PBRA owners. Somebody asked, "What is PBRA?" It's Project Based Rental Assistance. Um, to distinguish it from project based vouchers, which are something different. Project-based rental assistance is um, also known as multifamily. 
Um, sometimes it's also known as Section 8, but there's a lot of things that are known as Section 8. So, um, so like, so for folks that didn't know what that acronym was, and also this is being recorded. It will be posted on the FSS resources page um, probably after, probably sometime next week, um, we'll be able to get it up there. Uh, the slides will also be made available. So um, don't feel like you have to write everything down. And all the links in the slides will be live once we make the slides available on the website as well. But um, in the meantime, um, maybe one of my colleagues can post in the chat the link to join the FSS mailing list. Um, this is really important because our FSS mailing list, it comes out through a platform called Gov Delivery. Um, and it's our primary method of communicating with the FSS community, both grantees and non-grantees, um, PHAs and PBRA owners. And this is where um, when you, there's not a ton of messages, maybe a couple a week at the most, sometimes there won't be any for, you know, a couple weeks. Um, thanks, Eileen, for posting it in there. Um, but um Th this you want to be connected this way because this is how we share um, for grantees, you know, reminders about when things are due. Um, uh, we're going to be starting to post uh, a a set of um, we haven't decided what to call them, sort of like job aids, desk guides, visual explainers, kind of um, chunked up pieces of information about the FSS program, both how to run it in terms of like the grant side of things, also best practices. We're gonna be sending those through the listserv. Um, we, uh, you know, if there are any, you know, sort of interesting uh, studies, sometimes we post those there. If there are interesting resources available, sometimes we post those there too. And then we'll also do um, like one part of our team is Hudstrong Families. They put together a newsletter of resources that are available to, um, to everyone. And if you're on the FSS listserv, we also send you the Hudstrong Families newsletter and things like that. So um, please, please, please go ahead and get um, onto the FSS mailing list. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is uh, we're going to kind of run through an FSS 101 we're going to be looking at the grant agreement. We're going to be talking about startup steps um, and then kind of what's what's next. Um, and again, this is mostly for people who are kind of brand new, both to having a grant um, for FSS and also maybe brand new to the FSS program. Um, so I think this is, Jason, this is still me. I can't see the list that you sent. Um, yes. Okay. So very, very high level. The essential pieces for FSS are that there's case management or coaching. We generally, we've been moving towards a coaching model away from the old traditional case management model. Um, but uh, basically it's that there, there is a dedicated person who works with participants to help them set goals and then connect them to resources to meet those goals. And then there's also a financial incentive, which is the FSS escrow. Um, so it's not an FSS program if it doesn't have both of these pieces. So that's just really important to remember. Some of you may come from a world that Ha, does a lot of different kind of supportive services programs. And those are all really wonderful, but FSS in particular has has both both of these pieces. So it's actually easier for me to um, have you watch this cute little video that our partners at Compass Working Capital put together um, rather than explain it all. So for the next two minutes, we'll just all watch this video together. You work hard every day to provide for yourself and your family because you have dreams and plan to bring them to life. But some- Oops. Sorry, that was me. Sometimes challenges come up that get in the way. The Family Self-Sufficiency Program, or FSS, can help you get ahead and reach your goals. Maybe you want to start an emergency fund, pay off debt, or build your credit. Or maybe you want to become a homeowner. FSS can help you take steps towards your goals. Typically, every time you or someone in your household earns more money, your rent goes up. This can make saving difficult, if not impossible. 
But with FSS, your rent increase is deposited into your savings account instead. Here's how it works. First, meet with your FSS coach to enroll in the program and set your goals. Then, when you find a job or increase your pay at work, you'll pay your new higher rent and your housing provider will also make a deposit into your FSS savings account. This deposit will usually equal the amount of your rent increase. Over time, your FSS account grows. You receive one-on-one -on -one support and coaching. You might even be able to withdraw money from your account during the program. Maybe you need a new car for work or want to complete a certificate program. You can use your FSS savings to help make progress towards your goals. We know what you're thinking, but it's not too good to be true. You increase your income, pay your rent as usual, and money goes directly into your FSS savings account. The program is completely voluntary, and you will not lose your housing assistance by participating. To graduate, you will need to meet the goals you set for yourself, be employed, and make sure everyone in your household has been off cash welfare assistance at the time of graduation. FSS typically lasts at least five years, but you can graduate sooner. You may also be able to extend your time in the program to keep saving. Once you've completed the program, use your savings however you see fit. You want to give your family the life they deserve. You aren't alone. FSS can help. Join FSS today, save part of your rent, and make your dreams a reality. So <clears throat> thank you to Compass Working Capital that um, put that together. That is available. They've made that available for free to everyone. Um, it is available on our FSS resources page. Um, and I know a lot of current programs like to use that um, when they do presentations to potentially potential new partners, also potential new participants, also sometimes to their senior staff and board, especially if they're new of like, what have we gotten ourselves into? What is this program? This is a great little um, brief explainer that goes over all the highlights. Um, and uh, I also know some, some um, folks put it on in like, if they have a video running in their lobby where people are waiting, sometimes it's a great place to put it on. You can just have it on loop. Um, so Compass has made this available for um, for anyone to use. So we are really appreciative of that. Um, you oops. work hard every day do to that. provide for yourself. There we go. All right, so I am gonna turn it over to, so we work as a team um, here at HUD and on the public housing side, um, our team primarily consists of myself. I never even introduced myself. I'm so sorry. I'm Anisi Chenault. Um, and we have Jason Amarhaji and Eileen Mostyn, who, um, and Carla Davis is not on uh, the webinar today, but um, that's our core team on the public housing side. And then um, Libby, do you want to introduce yourself and the other folks on the multifamily side? Sure. My name is Libby Fernandez, and I'm a supervisory program analyst in the Office of Multifamily Housing Programs, which oversees the project-based rental assistance program. And um, I'm not sure if they're on the web. I don't think Jared's on the webinar today, um, but my also we have also my colleague Andrew Santos and uh, Jared Machado, who also work with me in the PBRA program on family self-sufficiency. Awesome. And then we have um, a couple of other folks who help us with things like the website redesign and some really great tools for tracking expenditures um, that are also on our team in OPHI. And then we've got the whole um, field office team on the public housing side. And there's also a field office team on the multifamily side um, who you all will be working with that are that kind of make up the broader um, FSS team. So today you'll be hearing from uh, myself, Jason, Eileen, and Libby on this call. So I'm going to turn this over to Eileen to tell us about the competition. Thank you, Anisi. Uh, so as Marianne alluded to in her um, opening statements, um, we had a lot of interest in the FSS program this year. Um, so here are some numbers kind of summarizing the results of the competition for new FY23 uh, FSS grants. We received 254 unique applications 
uh, and of that group, 229 were eligible for funding. We unfortunately uh, did not have funds available to award all of these grantees, and so we uh, awarded through a lottery. So um, everyone had the same random chance of being selected for funding. Um, through the lottery, we were able to fund 82 new FSS grants, 29 of those went to public housing authorities, and 53 went to PBRA owners. Um, so that leaves us with, unfortunately, 147 um, who we were not able to fund this year. Um, in total, we awarded $8,013,334 in new awards this year. About one third of that was uh, for public housing authorities and about two thirds was for PBRA owners. Um, so we're super excited about all the interest in the program um, and to have 82 new grantees this year. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Libby to talk about the next slide. Hey, um, so, you know, uh, as Anisi has said, the FSS program has been running for a long time. Some of you, um, you know, from the survey probably have been here pretty much since the beginning. Others are, you know, very new to the program. So the program has operated in public housing and voucher programs since 1990. And then in 2015, Congress authorized expansion of FSS to the project-based rental assistance portfolio. So these are privately owned, HUD-subsidized multifamily properties. And in 2018, uh, PBRA owners were made eligible for grants with the reauthorization of the statute. And then in uh, 2022, when we published the final rule, we, were, we put that new statute into effect and were able to um, make PBRA owners eligible for grant funding in the next NOFO. So we have now um, just you know, announced the second round um, of new awards. And we are very excited to be expanding the program to include more PBRA properties. A lot of PBRA folks have been waiting for years and years, advocating for the expansion of the program. And so it's super exciting to finally be able to uh, help them get started with, with FSS grants. So multifamily owners can still use other funding sources, even if they have not received a grant, they can continue a voluntary unfunded FSS program using funding sources such as a private grant, uh, residual receipts if you have them, or other non-HUD funds. So in some cases, owners have used surplus cash if it's available. Um, other owners have used revenue from other parts of their portfolio that they have put in as a contribution to cover the cost of the salary and benefits for the coordinator. Um, but, you know, so whether you have a grant or you're funding it through other means, FSS is, of course, voluntary for PBRA programs. Um, you also have the option of serve, having your residents serve through a cooperative agreement. So a neighboring public housing authority or other PBRA owner um, could enter into a cooperative agreement with you if they if their coordinator has bandwidth to serve your residents. Now, the owner of each property will still be responsible for managing the escrows since they are the ones who are vouchering for that subsidy, but the case management could be provided by an FS coordinator at another housing provider. Um, minimum participation is generally five years some families graduate sooner. On, uh, on average, it's about three and a half years, um, whereas others take a little longer and can get um, up to two years in extensions to continue with their program. Um, and I guess I'll pass it back for the next slide. Great. Thanks, Libby. So I leave um, with you. Yep. Yep. So um, first, I wanted to go over some of the, the basics of the FSS grant. 
Um, so in terms of eligible uses of funds, it's pretty simple. There's just one, um, and that's salary and fringe for an FSS coordinator. Uh, those fringe benefits can include a training stipend uh, if you requested an amount um, to cover that. Um, and we'll talk more about the training stipend soon and, and give you some examples of what that can be used for. Uh, new grantees were given grants to pay for the salary and fringe benefits of one full-time equivalent FSS coordinator, which is equal to up to 2,080 hours per calendar year. Um, additionally, there is the option of using cooperative agreements for grantees. Um, so one grantee can serve other PBRA properties by setting up a cooperative agreement. Uh, and we will be sharing a, a sample cooperative agreement. Um, hopefully that will be coming out soon. Um, you cannot serve a Section 202 or 811 property um, using a cooperative agreement. Uh, and then also here wanted to address joint applicants. Um, we, we do allow for uh, properties to apply jointly for the FSS program as well. Um, all properties will need to submit their own action plan um, for their FSS program. Um, these applicants will then share an FSS coordinator who will be responsible for serving residents at all sites, um, but the, each owner will be responsible for escrowing their own tenants uh, and keeping track of those finances. You get to the next slide, please. So next, we need to talk a bit about the escrow funds. Um, so first, um, in terms of who is responsible for the escrow, who that escrow money belongs to, um, the escrow funds are HUD funds until a participant completes their contract of participation and graduates from the FSS program, at which point they receive the escrow and uh, it belongs to them. Uh, one option uh, for FSS programs is to set up a policy around interim disbursements where uh, a participant can access some of their escrow funds before graduating um, to be used for a specific purpose uh, that will help them achieve some of the goals laid out in their ITSP. Um, so an example of this might be helping to pay for tuition or, or other costs that um, come up as they're they're working on their goals in the FSS program. Um, this is something that you would need to set up a local policy on uh, through your FSS action plan, which we'll discuss more in detail later. Uh, additionally, if a participant doesn't graduate from the FSS program, uh, then they forfeit their escrow and that fund, th those funds stay with the program to then be used for the benefit of FSS participants. Uh, like interim disbursements, you can set up your own local policies around uh, how forfeited escrow is used, uh, what the process is like for requesting to use forfeited escrow. Um, but one important thing here is that this must be used only for the benefit of FSS participants. Forfeited escrow can't be used for something like administrative costs. Um, it has to go towards the benefit of FSS participants. Um, and just a note related to that for first point about um, Who's, who the escrow is. Uh, once a family graduates and receives their escrow, um, that funding belongs to them. And so there are no limitations on how they can use their escrow um, after they've received it after graduating. Great, and just um, remember everyone, this is sort of the very high level. We're gonna move kind of quickly through this, but there is a guidebook um, that is available to everyone. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's also going to be an online training, which will be required um, for everyone. And so there's a lot more information on each of these topics, including like best practices and things to think about when you're setting your policies that are all available um, in those other resources if we don't, if we're not able to get to them today. Um, all right, so we're gonna, now we're gonna talk about the grant agreement. Jason, I think that's you, right? All right. Uh, thanks, Nisi. So uh, the grant agreement is really, uh, I think, uh, sort of an underutilized space. Uh, you know, a lot of times people sort of pass it off to their executive, get it signed, and, and maybe never look at it again. But it really is sort of the core of the program. It's, it's the agreement between HUD and yourselves that lays out key responsibilities, roles, you know, all the relevant timelines and obligations. And so anytime you have a question, of course, 
you can always come to us. We have our you know, office hours we'll talk about later. We have you know FAQs and guidance on our website. But the the grant agreement, you know, despite being somewhat legalese and, and maybe a little intimidating, is really the, the place to go to find all the relevant information. So we would encourage you even just to take a cursory look at it, you know, see if there's sections that pertain to things that you know you might be working on and, and make sure that you have an understanding of what it says because ultimately that's where we base a lot of our you know deadlines requirements um, and guidance there so you know the first place to go really anytime you have a question would be the the grant ag agreement and um you know so the the first step of course is uh finding the grant agreement well it's um part of your notice of award that's in grant solutions so you all um, applied uh, for the grant through grants.gov, and then we made our awards through Grant Solutions. And it is an attachment to the notice of award, which is uh, letting you know that you've received the FSS award, and um, that's where you sign it. And um, basically, you know that that's what starts the grant. Um, you can also just find sort of like a blank copy of it on the FSS resources page um, on HUD.gov. And, um, you know, that that's always a place you can go. But if you want to find your particular copy, it would be on Grant Solutions. Um, next slide. So what is the period of performance? Um, for those folks who, um, you know, may have worked on FSS before or, or be somewhat familiar, um, you'll know that we run the FSS program on a calendar year basis. So that is uh, January 1st through December 31st. And we um, do all of our funding determinations and calculations based on uh, one calendar year. So uh, for folks who are just getting this new grant, what does that mean? Because uh, we didn't make the announcements until February 14th. You know, it was a nice Valentine's treat for those of us who uh, were funded. And that's wonderful. But, but what about the period from January 1st until um, February 14th? So if you haven't been running a program and you know this is the first you've heard of it, um, you know you have uh, from February 14th through December 31st to run the program and get reimbursed for sort of a prorated portion of your award um, for that period. Uh, some folks may have been running a program prior. You may have you know had people maybe you were already planning to implement a program before you got funded. And so you were doing eligible FSS activities from January 1st through February 14th. And then it was a lucky coincidence that you got the grant. If that's the case, um, you can actually be reimbursed for those costs starting January 1st through February 14th. You'll need approval from your field office or grant specialist if you're multifamily. Um, so you can't just sort of do that without requesting permission. But if you let them know that that's what you'd like to do, um, you know, they can review that. And, um, you know, if you're approved, you'll be able to draw expenses from January 1st through February 14th. So again, if you're doing FSS activities that are eligible and paid for out of the grant, you can be reimbursed. If not, that's fine. Um, get started now and you can apply for reimbursement for any activities, you know, after February 14th um, through the end of this calendar year. Uh, for future years, we have a process um, to renew the grant, and that's how you would get funding for future calendar years. Next slide. No. Uh, all right. So, you know, what are uh, eligible activities? Um, you know, and this is really, I think, an important area because, um, you know, the, the FSS grant does a lot of things, right? But But the funding that we're giving you really just does one thing, and that is it covers the salary and fringe for one FSS coordinator position. You're all new grantees, so you're all only being funded for one position to start with. We hope in the future we will be able to expand the number of positions based on the number of participants that you are serving. We can't currently do that. So in the beginning of the grant, you start with one full-time equivalent position. And so that is their salary, their fringe. And as you can see here, the fringe can include a training stipend. That training stipend can include training-related travel. Um, so, you know, how you define fringe is up to you, but that was the basis of the amount that you requested, and that is the basis of the amount awarded. So um, that's it. It can't fund um, administrative costs. There's no indirect cost rate. Unfortunately, it cannot fund services. Those are things that you'll have to get out of community match or other agency funds. Um, but we are basically funding for the position of the FSS coordinator and, and that's it. In fact, the escrow, which is a big part of 
FSS is not funded through the grant either. So um, it's funded in other ways. So that's not coming out of your pockets, but um, it's not funded through these grant funds. Uh, there is a note here that says, you know, you can do things like job sharing. So when we say one full-time equivalent, that can be one person working 40 hours a week, it could be two people working 20 hours a week each. Um, but it is important to know that, um, you know, you can't have, you can't reimburse for more than one full-time equivalent position. So you can't have three people working 20 hours a week each. You, you can have it, you just can't get reimbursed for all three of those positions. Um, and you're also allowed to do subcontracting. So, you know, you can find another agency or entity if you want to run the program and subcontract to them. Um, that is up to you. The last bullet point here, and I don't know um, if someone could pop this into the chat, but we have on our website a list of eligible activities, a table that kind of just lays out for you what is allowable, what isn't. And, um, you know, I would just have a copy of that printed out at my desk, you know, pinned up on the on the bulletin board, um, you know, just digitally saved, bookmarked, because it's a, it's a great reference. Anytime you have a question about what's eligible or what isn't, we would hate for uh, anything to happen where, you know, there's any financial issues if you're drawing for ineligible expenses. So really, you know, this is a critical piece to just understand and make sure that, you know, it is just the salary and fringe um, that is eligible to be reimbursed under this grant. And let me just interject there. We do have a, a couple of people asked, how do I know if um, my agency included a training stipend? And um, so here's the thing. We don't actually even know. In the application, HUD, we only asked for one number. We said to, potential, to applicants, we said, tell us within the parameters of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, how much does it cost for salary and fringe for a, a program coordinator in your geographic area. Um, and we said kind of here are some guardrails that you need to stay between or explain why you need more than that. Um, and then we said, you may include when you're, when you're calculating your fringe, um, you know, you say, okay, I'm going to have medical, I'm going to have dental, I'm going to have, um, uh, you know, um, Social Security, like all those taxes that that have to be taken out. Uh, maybe you have life insurance. Maybe you don't. Um, you know, kind of whatever. But one of those things that uh, whoever was doing the application could have included was a training stipend. We didn't have any requirements over um, whether that was included or how much would be included each year. Um, we just said, you know, if you want a training stipend, include it in your calculations. Um, so. Uh, the answer is we don't know, your field office doesn't know, the only person who knows whether you included a training stipend in your calculations um, is whoever put in your application. So you would need to talk to whoever that was at your agency, um, uh, your PBRA owner or um, your PHA. Um, and then I'll also say, uh, just to be really clear, uh, for all the new awardees, even though we announced your award on February 14th, we still gave you a full 12 months of funding. Um, so what that is, is up to basically 2,080 hours, which is 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year. You have that many hours um, spend on the FSS grant this year before the end of the year. If you have some money, you know, if you have a month and a half worth of money left over, or even if it takes you a little while to hire someone and you have some money left over at the end, we'll just recapture that and we can use that to make future grants. Um, that won't really count against you because we know you're just starting up and things like that, but, um, but you will have a full 12 months worth of funding available to you. Um, and um, you can start using that uh, you know, if you haven't hired your coordinator already, if you've got someone on your staff who's spending time putting together a, uh, um, a job description and posting it and um, starting to work to bring together your partners and, you know, starting to set up your internal systems and writing your FSS action plan, um, all of those things are things that a new grantee has to do. Um, ideally, they'd be done by your program coordinator, but we know that you can't put the cart before the horse sometimes and you need to have someone who's um, doing that work. So you would just need to be very careful to record that person's um, hours that are spent specifically on FSS, um, and then you could draw for that time. Um, all right, you ready for the next slide? Yep, but let me just say, I mean, please put questions in the q and I did just see a question in the chat um, about 
how do you access escrow funding if you're not getting funding from HUD? You are getting funding from HUD for the escrow. It's being reimbursed from the source account. Um, so it's not being reimbursed from the grant. That's different. Um, and we, we can talk more about that. But um, it's, it's just a, a mechanical thing that you cannot get reimbursed for the escrow through this grant funding. The good news about that is you don't even need this grant funding to run an FSS program and you can still fund the escrow through the source account. So um, really what we're doing, which is above and beyond what anybody can do and what, what you're able to do now is get funded for the staffing to support the program, uh, which not everybody is able to have, unfortunately. Right. Um, got a couple of other questions here. Um, the grant ends at the 12, 31, 24, that, that is, uh, correct. It is one calendar year soft tracking software, um, case management software is considered an admin expense and is not an eligible expense, um, for this grant. Um, and, uh, in the training stipend, you may also include travel. So if you're going to go someplace for a conference or something like that. Um, you can include both the conference registration and um, and the travel, you know, in the hotel stay, et cetera, per diem, et cetera. Um, let's see if there's any, anything else before we keep moving. Um, Kelly Hunter, I don't understand your question. If you could send that again, that'd be helpful. Um, all right, question on job sharing. Um, my salary is divided three ways since I wear several hats. If I were to have another employee in the office assist with FSS, can a portion of their salary be paid from the grant not exceeding that of a full-time employee? So basically, again, you have 280 or two hours. You can divide those amongst people as you see fit. Um, for doing eligible FSS activities. If you do divide them between more than one person, you would need to be very careful to keep the keep records of um, the hours that are spent on FSS versus something else. Um, also, any particular person can't be paid more than a full-time salary. So if you're already being paid for full-time from your operating fund or some other fund, you can't then also add on 20 hours of FSS and be paid for a job and a half. Um, so, um, that's really critical. It is really, um, I would say I would generally discourage job sharing. It is most straightforward if you have one person um, who is the coordinator who's doing that work for 40 hours, um, you know, for, for full time um, of their time. It's just, it's straightforward. Um, you know who's on first, um, who's in charge of the program, but if you would like to, you may share it amongst people who are doing FSS activities, and that could be um, if you need to, you know, a supervisor, a finance person, um, you know, sort of other people for, for a few hours. But again, remember, you can't pay the coordinator 40 hours and then also pay a finance person five hours and a supervisor five hours or things like that. So hopefully that's clear. Um, if you don't spend the whole award by the end of the year, uh, right now the system is such that we will just take back whatever money is left over. Um, if there seems to be a persistent issue year after year that you're um, requesting too much money or not spending the money, um, you know, we, we may look at adjusting how much money you get in the future. But especially for this first year, we understand that it may take some time to to start up. So it's not um, it's not terribly unusual to have a first year grantee um, not use up all of the money. Um, let's see. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, keep going, Jason, and um, I think we'll get to some of these other questions. Great, I think this is you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so um, one of the things that we get asked a lot is whether FSS coordinators can do standard housing functions. And so usually what that means is rent calculations, recertifications, interim um, recertifications, annuals, et cetera. Sometimes it also means um, housing quality inspections. Um, th that's pretty rare, but um, the answer is maybe. <laughs> um, so number one, 
Um, an FSS coordinator can never, ever, ever do those functions for people who are not in FSS. So that's number one. That's never, ever allowable, and there's no way to get that approved. But we have heard um, from our grantees that some, most do not want to have their FSS coordinators doing those housing functions because there are other people that are specialists in those roles. They do the rent recalculation and they work very closely with the FSS coordinator, but there's two people doing two different functions. There are some grantees, however, who prefer to have the FSS coordinator be the one stop for any family that's an FSS, which means that that FSS coordinator gets trained on how to do rent recertifications, um, not using FSS dollars, by the way, um, and does sort of all of the functions um, that the housing authority or PBRA owner would do with that family. They always go to that FSS coordinator while that person is in the FSS program. Um, sometimes they say they like it better that way because that then, you know, the coordinators say, I always know when there's a change, I'm the one person that that, you know, person comes to for everything. Um, I am kind of the face of their rental assistance and it's easier just, you know, with our rapport to have it that way. Um, I, I can make sure that those researches are done, um, you know, in a on a timely basis that, that go, you know, go along with the um, escrow calculations and any changes to the contract of participation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they prefer to do it that way. If your housing authority or agency wants to do it that way and wants to have the FSS prog uh, program coordinator also do the standard housing functions, they need to, you need to submit a request for approval to your um, to your field office or your grant specialist and basically explain why it's better for your program to do it that way and how it won't um, impede the FSS coordinator's time for doing, you know, specifically FSS activities. Um, so once um, you do that and it's approved, you don't, you don't have to do it on an annual basis. You only have to do it once, um, but you do need uh, to do to do it once. And then if you start kind of down that path and you try it and you say, mm, this isn't working for me, you can just let your field office um, or grant specialist know, hey, we thought we were going to try it that way. It turns out it doesn't work. We're going to go back the other way. Um, it, you're not stuck one way just because you asked for permission, but that's a really um, kind of what we don't want to see, which we have seen in the past, unfortunately, is that sometimes um, PHAs or owners are like, great, another staff person. We'll just kind of give them a standard um, housing specialist job, and then they can do FSS kind of like on the side. And that's really where we want to be very protective of that FSS coordinator's time and that funding to be just for FSS. Um, so hopefully that all makes sense. Um, a lot of people ask us, what can the training stipend include? And um, so um, one of the things that it can include are memberships to national organizations that um, kind of support FSS. Um, so that could be uh, NARO, Compass Working Capital, American Association of Service Coordinators. Um, those are the ones that we know about that sort of actively engage with FSS, but other um, professional or industry organizations that work with service coordinators in this kind of a function. Now, I did see someone said, um, someone ended up going to a, tra a service coordinator training um, that was halfway across the country, and it was for service coordinators in hospitals, which were really like the, the words were the same, but it was not the same kind of a program. So that would not be, um, uh, you know, an allowable use of, um, of training. But um, there are several organizations out there that run um, kind of standard FSS regulations training. So Nan McKay is a big one, um, NARO, um, let's see, Quadel, Nelrod, you know, kind of your big TA um, organizations. Um, training and coaching um, could be something like a coactive coaching or any uh, life coaching. All of those are kind of, you know, generally um, coaching training, motivational interviewing, generally trauma-informed care. Online, you can do a financial social work certification. That would be a great training. Um, NeighborWorks often has some great trainings. Um, a training in something around human-centered design um, can be really critical when thinking about their workflow and your forms and your policies and all these kind of things. So it's really broad. It's kind of anything that's going to help make your um, 
make your FSS program better um, is what the training could include. Um, but again, even though um, there are some software companies that do sell um, case management software, um, training on that case management software and paying for that case, case management software are, are not eligible activities. Um, so speaking of training, um, oh, I think this is Eileen. Eileen, is this you? Yes, I think so. Great, go for it. Great. <laughs> um, yes, so like Anissi said, speaking of training, um, we have a mandatory online FSS training um, that will be updating and putting out a new version, we expect by the end of March. Um, so this training goes over kind of just the basics of FSS. It's very comprehensive and tells you everything that you need to know about how the FSS program works um, and gives you some really great tools for making sure that the FSS program that you're implementing is successful. Uh, there is a, an FSS training that you might see online And currently, um, that training 2022. If you would like to take a look at that training, you're welcome to do so. Uh, but we expect that this new updated training will be out um, in within the next month, hopefully. Uh, and so, it's also fine if you just wait for that one. Um, that training that comes out um, at, by the end of March, that one is mandatory. Uh, so once we publish it, you'll have 90 days to. Um... Oh, did my sounds go out? Uh, yes, but basically, I think what we missed was just that um, there is the old online training is available now, but it was not updated since the final rule in 2022, and the new online training will be posted, you were just saying, go ahead. Yep, so um, that will be posted by the end of March, um, and so if you'd like to take a look at the, the old training in the meantime, you're welcome to do that, but the updated version will be up soon. Uh, and that new version is mandatory to complete. So once we publish that, you'll have 90 days to complete the training. Um, we're requiring that at least one person from every FSS program complete that training. Uh, there's a quiz at the end that you'll be able to, to fill out so that we know that um, if you received a passing score on the quiz that you've completed the training. Um, and after those 90 days, we'll send the field offices a list of programs who are in compliance with the requirement to complete the mandatory training. And if at that point you're not in compliance, your grant may be suspended until you complete the training and are in compliance with this requirement. Uh, additionally, available online, we have the FSS guidebook, uh, as well as a lot of other resources available on HUD Exchange. Uh, the FSS guidebook might be a little intimidating. It is a, a long document, but um, hopefully once you start reading it, you'll see that the language itself is not intimidating. It really explains everything about the FSS program very clearly, and we really highly recommend that everybody review that guidebook. It has a lot of great information uh, and is a really useful tool in, again, ensuring that your FSS program um, is implemented successfully um, and everything runs smoothly. Um, lots of questions that you might have will have very detailed answers in the guidebook. Um, I think that's everything on training then. Uh, so next, another requirement of the FSS program is the FSS action plan. Uh, so the action plan basically lays out um, your plan for how you're going to implement FSS at your organization. All new programs must have an FSS action plan approved by your local field office or account executive before you can enroll any FSS participants into your program. Uh, so new grantees in your first year of funding are required to draft your action plan and submit it to your field office uh, for their approval by March 31st. Um, if you already have an action plan, for example, if you've already been operating an unfunded FSS program, uh, it's not required that you submit a new action plan, but you may submit a new one if you'd like to make any updates or changes to that. Uh, but if you already have one approved, it's not required for you to submit another one. Uh, 
One last note here is that grantees are required to enroll at least 25 participants into your FSS program before December 31st of this year in order to be considered eligible for renewal funding um, under the FY25 um, renewal FSS NOFO. Um, so one note here is that all new grantees will have a grace year. We understand it takes time to um, get your program up and running and to enroll participants. Um, so you'll be eligible for FY24 funding automatically if you're a new grantee in FY23, uh, but in order to uh, be considered eligible for funding in FY25, you'll need to have um, 25 participants enrolled in the program. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a couple of these questions. Um, as we go about the uh, several questions about the job sharing, um, if you're doing both roles, FSS coordinator and housing analyst, how should you be paid? How many hours should be invested in FSS during the week? So if you're paid 100% from the FSS grant, you should only be working on FSS. If you if you if your agency gets permission that you can do the housing functions for your FSS participants, then that can come under your 40 hours of FSS. Um, but if you are, um, basically what you may not do is spend half your time on FSS and half your time on um, anything else, basically, and be paid full time from the, um, from the FSS grant. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. If you still are unclear or kind of feel that you might be in a um, not that situation, you can send a message to FSS at HUD.gov. Um, in, uh, or MF underscore FSS at head.gov if you're multifamily and we can help you kind of look through that. Um, so, um, could a percentage of your HCV manager be charged to FSS since, um, he or she oversees the FSS coordinator? So again, you've got 40 hours. Anybody who's doing anything that is an eligible activity under the FSS grant, which would include supervising an FSS coordinator, could be charged to the grant. But think about if you're charging five or 10 hours to the supervisor, that's only then 30 or 35 hours to the coordinator to do the FSS activities. So the neatest and cleanest and really kind of most effective way to do it is that you've got one person who's working full-time on the FSS program and they're being paid full-time out of the FSS grant. Um, so um, we um, talked a little bit about the, um, the grant, the grant is one year. We do, it is, uh, so a couple of people asked if you're a new grantee, do you automatically get funding for five years? The answer is no. Um, you get funding one year at a time. Those of you who are new grantees this year um, will need to apply for funding next year. However, since you have until the end of December to enroll your first 25 participants, um, you, and we will give you funding We'll kind of be making our funding determinations in the fall, early winter of this year. Um, new grantees this year will automatically be eligible for funding next year. You'll still have to apply, but um, we won't be looking at and holding you to um, a minimum number of participants. Um, those of you, I know there are some of you who are on the line who were first time grantees last year. Um, I know I've gotten this question a lot is like, hey, we didn't get our money sorted out until June. Um, you know, we haven't had time to enroll all 25 um, participants. Um, and so it will very likely you will have continued eligibility again um, when the FY24 funding vehicle comes out. Um, so that you uh, will be eligible for, for funding again. Um, you are automatically eligible for 23, and it's um, very likely that we will take a look at the eligibility requirements for, um, for 24 and sort of um, grandfather you all in. But this is really important, um, which is that if for whatever reason you don't get funding for the following year, say you forget to apply, you apply late. Unfortunately, we see this happen every year um, that there's you know a small handful of um, eligible 
renewal applicants that um, just don't request the funding that they're eligible for, um, you are still legally required to honor those contracts of participation. So um, our Office of General Counsel, our legal folks have determined, determined a long time ago that the contract of participation is a legally binding contract between the participant and the housing authority or the owner, which means that regardless of whether you get funding or now listen, our, our program has been funded for 30 years straight. I don't anticipate this happening, but if somehow we did not get funded one year for the FSS program, um, you are still legally obligated to honor those contracts of participation, um, even though HUD doesn't give you funding. I know that sounds like kind of a scary prospect, but for 30 years, really, you know, nothing catastrophic has happened. We've had funding available every year. And also um, in our statute, it requires that we fund all renewal grantees that have met kind of whatever performance requirements we we set out before we fund any new positions or new grantees. Um, and um, for the past several years, like our funding has grown um, from about 80 million five years ago and to this year we had 125 million. So we're moving very much in the right direction. That's why we've been able to do these new grants. Um, so I, I would assume as long as you get your application in um, that uh, you will, you know, and that um, after the first year you are serving the minimum number of participants that you will be continue to be um, funded. But we just, we have to say this. Um, all right, who's doing draws? Is that me? I think that's me. Um, okay, so we've had some questions in the chat about how how do we get our money, right? So um, you get your money through the locks system and we'll have another some slides later on about how to make sure that you have access in locks. Um, but what's important to know about this grant is that it is it is a cost reimbursable reimbursable grant, which means that you have to incur the costs first before you voucher for them in the locks system. Um, and then once you get the money from the locks system, you have to pay it out to whoever you owe it to within three days of getting the money. So um Usually what that means uh, for an FSS grant, which is just for a salary, is that you may, you know, pay the salary out, maybe out of your sort of general funds, draw it down from locks, and then replace your general funds. Um, but what's really important here is that, unfortunately, we see sometimes, um, somehow, like, miraculously, um, folks are drawing exactly one twelfth of the grant every month. And... Um, it's very unlikely that you would have exactly the same amount that's a perfectly round amount that's exactly one twelfth of the grant every month. And if your field office um, or grant specialist sees that, it is within their purview to say, hey, can you send me the documentation to show me um, who, like, who you've been being paid and the hours that they're being paid and their salary and their fringe. Um, and like, if you've done any training to show me exactly kind of how you arrived at that number. Um, so the reality is it's probably not gonna be exactly the same thing every month. And what we certainly don't wanna see you doing is, you know, going in in June and drawing down exactly six months of the grant and just being like, yep, that's what I spent the first six months. Any draw for more than 10% of the grant will trigger what's called an automatic review, which means that um, your field office or grant specialist will have to approve that draw in locks. And they may request from you that backup documentation, especially for newer grantees, just to make sure that, um, that you are calculating things correctly and only drawing for eligible expenses. Now, any draw under 10% will automatically be approved and it'll kind of fly under the radar. But um, it's even if it's a, grant, uh, a draw for less than 10%, your uh, field office or your um, grant specialist um, can still ask you for that documentation and in fact probably will um, 
for, for, for new grantees. Now, somebody said, who exactly is doing that? So for if you're a PHA, it's whoever your portfolio management specialist is at your field office. That's going to be the person who handles um, the draws for your FSS funds. And if you are a PBRA owner, that will be, um, Libby, do you, how would you want to explain who will be responsible for their um, lock straws? Yes, so the uh, lock straws and anything else to do with locks or grants management, you would work with your grant specialist. If you haven't previously had a federal grant, you may not have worked with a grant specialist before. So this is a separate role from your account executive or resolution specialist, but it's a multifamily staff person who specializes in working with grantees and they're there to help you with issues related to locks access, um, and will also be the ones approving your drawdowns and uh, helping with troubleshooting if need be. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have a question on the action plan. Um, if we don't have our staff person hired by March 31st, is the action plan still due by that time? So right now, yes, the action plans are still due by March 31st. Um, we likely will give an extension on that, but if you know that um, you're going to need some more time, please be in communication again with your PMS or your grant specialist, um, just to let them know like, hey, I know this is coming. I'm on it. I'm working on it. Like, here's the situation. You just want to have good communication um, between yourselves and your PMS or um, your grant specialist. And just also know you can't start enrolling anyone in your program until your FSS action plan is approved. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the trigger. Um, also, great question about um, can, uh, is 25 participants per coordinator, is that a minimum or a maximum? And the answer is that is most definitely a minimum. Um, industry standard is 50 to one. Um, and uh, um, I've seen actually some very, very high performing grantees that he have as many as 100 to one. Now, those also have a very strong sort of infrastructure around them that are, they're at very large agencies or are partnering with a very large agency. Um, and there are other people doing a lot of the work of bringing in um, the partners and running the program coordinating committees and um, doing a lot of the administrative stuff. So it, um, they, you know, have 100% of their time just to do case management. Um, but I'd say, you know, 25 to 50 um, for each coordinator is is pretty standard. Um, 25 is just the minimum. Um, okay. Um, and then I have a question about the training. Only one person from each organization can take the training. No, only one person is required to take the training. If you would like to have every single person at your organization take the training, that would be fantastic. And in fact, I would really recommend anyone who's working on FSS from the frontline staff, the supervisors, you know, maybe even your senior staff if they don't really know what FSS is, um, to to take the training because um, I think it's it's just good to have a an overall understanding of it. Um, so we get this question sometimes: How long do I have to keep my records? Um, so grant records, uh, this is actually in 2 CFR 200, it's not specific to FSS. Grant records need to be kept for at least three years um, from the uh, from the closeout of the grant. Um, I recommend keeping your um, participant files for as long as you can. And you are allowed to, you don't have to keep paper files. You can keep electronic files if you prefer. Um, so whatever works for you, but it's just, you know, it's always kind of a good idea to keep those files, especially if you allow for re-enrollments and somebody may come back to you in five years or eight years and say, hey, you know, I've had a life change. I would like to, you know, be in the program again. You may have some of that old stuff um, already available, um, et cetera. So, um, okay. So um, I'm going to flip this to Jason. And we only have 45 minutes left and um, a lot to get through. I'm very guilty, but um, so Jason, I'm gonna flip this to you and um, ask you to be as judicious as possible. Thank you, Anisi, not in my vocabulary. <laughs> not mine either. 
<laughs> so a lot of great information so far. Let me just take a pause and say, all right, this is the first time we're getting together here. We're very happy to have you on board. What's the most important stuff? Where do you start? Well, the most important thing from your perspective, I think, is how to get your money. And that is through uh, ELOX. Now, if you're a PHA, you may be familiar with ELOX. If you're a multifamily owner, maybe less so. Uh, we'll go over some details about that in a second. Equally important from our perspective, probably more important, is hiring your FSS coordinator because that's the only thing that you can spend your money on. And so, uh, you know, if you don't already have a coordinator in place to get that process started, you know, it really is the, the truly the single greatest asset in your program. Determinant of success is that coordinator. We'll talk about that more. Um, and then, you know, following that, we'll, we'll have a timeline, um, you know, in short order to get your action plan approved and um, really to start looking at bringing together your community partners for your PCC. And then ultimately, you know, getting residents involved, participating, you know, enrolling, um, really helping to shape and frame the program, ideally, as part of um, your planning. So that's kind of the priority of what you should be focusing on now. Uh, next slide. So just starting uh, right at the top with ELOCs, um, there is a form that you need to submit to get access if you don't have it already. Um, and that is the ELOX Access Authorization Form HUD 27054. Maybe we can put a link in the chat to that. There's a link in the slide. And um, what's important is, if you go to the next slide, is that you have to ask for the money um, sort of in the right way. So if you are a PHA um, on the form under um, box nine, Program Area Authorizations, it's a little um, counterintuitive. This is not the Ross program. You're not in the wrong place. This is the FSS program. But for the purposes of this form, where it says program area ID, you need to put Ross. And then where it says program area name, that's resident, opert, which is not the full word opportunity, and self-sufficiency, two separate words like that. So that's what you need to do if you're a PHA. And if you are a multifamily uh, owner, next slide. It's different, so different set of instructions. You need to put SSMF and under program area name, supportive services, multifamily. Libby, I don't know if you wanna say a little bit more about that. Um, Just that, you know, if as you are going through this process, you're having trouble, uh, I'd encourage you to reach out to your grant specialist. Um, we, if you're not sure who that is, then please reach out to mf underscore fss at head.gov. Um, but we will also be reaching out to folks to let them know who their grant specialist is and how to contact them if you're a PBRA grantee. Great. All right. Um, so uh, next slide. And I think uh, that's I think me, right? Okay, so the role of your FSS coordinator, I've been talking a lot about, um, you know, as long as somebody is doing um, a, a, an FSS sort of eligible activity. Um, so I'm not gonna go through each one of these, this is in the NOFO, it's in the grant agreement. Um, but basically what you need to remember is that the role of the FSS coordinator is both micro and macro. Um, so the FSS coordinator um, both um, does recruitment, outreach, enrollment, um, helps the participant set the, um, uh, complete the contract of participation, the individual training and services plan, um, and meets with the participants. Um, also, that's the micro. And then the macro is um, the FSS coordinator is also responsible for going into the community, recruiting partners, um, creating and maintaining those relationships, um, and building what's called the Program Coordinating Committee. Now, if you're in PBRA, technically you don't have to have a, P uh, a Program Coordinating Committee, but you have to have a group of service providers. So that's pretty much a Program Coordinating Committee. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's two sets of work. It's with residents and it's with the community. And then it's kind of connecting the two, right? Um, so the other thing that the coordinator um, would be doing is, um, you know, following up with the participants, following up on referrals to see how they went, um, calculating the escrow, um, making sure that the reporting is done correctly, either on the 50058 
um, which is the um, family report that goes into the PIC system, which will soon be the HIP system um, for on the public housing side, um, or does the FSS annual report for the multifamily side, which we'll talk about more later. Um, and um, yeah, it maintains the escrow calculation, um, gives a uh, report to the um, to the participants at least once a year on um, how much escrow they have in their account. So it's kind of, it's all of those pieces. It's the case management, it's the, um, and coaching, it's the administration of the program, and it's the partnership building and maintaining and kind of connecting all of those um, pieces together. So um, when you're thinking about hiring um, an FSS um, coordinator, um, you're going to want to think about someone who has both sets of those skills. Um, so it's not just another housing specialist. It's someone who really needs to know like how to how to work with families, um, how to work in the community, how to um, do that kind of coaching. Um, another thing to think about just in terms of best practices is that an FSS coordinator will very likely need to work at least, um, you know, maybe one or two days in the evening when, when the participants aren't working, maybe on a weekend every now and then. So having flexible hours um, is really critical. Also, um, I've heard from, unfortunately, a lot of places that say, oh, my supervisor says that if I'm not at my desk, I'm not working. Well, you cannot do this job from your desk. Um, an FSS coordinator needs to be out um, in the community, meeting partners at partner spaces so they can understand, you know, where those spaces are, what that looks like, um, creating and um, building and maintaining relationships with those service provider partners so that she can literally pick up the phone and be like, hey, this is Anisi from, you know, Anytown Housing Authority. Um, hey, Julie, how's your kid? Is, is, you know, is she feeling better? Hey, yeah, I've got this participant who I want to send over to you for a GED class. Like, can you fit her in? And um, because I have a relationship with Julie, Julie's gonna be like, oh yeah, Anissa, I got you, no worries. Like, you know, send her over, right? Um, that can't happen if I haven't had coffee with Julie and know that she had her, you know, her kid was sick, right? So that is also part of the role of the FSS coordinator. Um, also, um, the FSS coordinator needs to be out um, you know, meeting with families in their home, if that's where the families prefer, meeting after school where the, you know, where the kids are, meeting on the basketball court, meeting at a job site during lunchtime, um, you know, meeting at a local library, if that's what's closer to the family and the family doesn't want to have them, you know, in the home. So it's all sorts of stuff that needs to be out and about in um, in the community and um, really not at the desk. So you want to, when you're thinking about like, how do you set this up? Um, you want to be thinking about um, making sure that the person kind of has that orientation and has the supports and the supervisor to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, the How well the FSS program works is, I would say, having senior leadership be pro the program is, I don't know, 80% <laughs> of, how, of how well the program works. It is critical, critical, critical. So if you're a senior staff person and you're here, that's one of the huge things you can do. It means championing the program amongst the rest of the staff. Um, it means reminding folks that, hey, if you if you don't see, you know, if you don't see Nisi at her desk, it doesn't mean she's not working. She may be out in the community. That is her job. She's doing her job. Those kind of things can be really, really critical. Um, it may also be important for you as a senior staff person to make be the connector with um other um, service providers at the senior level, right? So there's only so much that can be done at the staff to staff level, and that's really important sometimes. But sometimes to really get a good engagement, you might need senior staff to senior staff level. Um, so all of these pieces are just really critical when you're thinking about who um, who to hire. So um, some other things to think about are, um, does your staff reflect your participants? It doesn't have to be. Um, but if you have, you know, half of your um, housing, uh, half of your homes are filled with people from a certain 
um, you know, ethnic community, it might be kind of important to have an FSS coordinator that speaks that language um, or understands that community's cultures and, um, and, and things like that. Um, organic intellectuals versus professionals, that's just another fancy way to say, um, you know, do you hire someone from the community um, who may or may not actually have like a bunch of educational uh, attainment behind their name? Um, or do you look for someone who, for instance, has a master's in social work and, um, you know, maybe doesn't know the community so well? There's pros and cons for both. Um, but I will tell you that if you do hire someone that is that is not able to connect with the community of people that are your potential participants, that's going to kind of go nowhere, no matter how like professionally skilled they are. Um, a lot of sites um, hire current or um, former residents. Um, there are some confidentiality issues around that. Sometimes, um, sometimes those folks really, really know the community well, and that's fantastic if they're trusted in the community and they kind of know um, where people are and who people are and how they're connected and um, know what the services are because they've um, taken part in them, and that can be really great. Other times, depending on the person and the situation, folks may say, mm, I don't trust my neighbor. I don't want to go to her and talk about all my sort of challenges. Um, and they may stay away. So again, there's pros and cons, but there is no, um, unlike with some other programs, there is no particular educational requirement. Um, and that's because, you know, we know that not everyone um, has the ability to, um, you know, to engage with the kind of standard educational system um, and, uh, but could still be a really fantastic um, coordinator or coach. Um, and then finally, think about your HR policies, um, background checks and drug tests in particular. Um, we had a, a site in our Jobs Plus program who wanted to hire someone as a community coach, which is not the same thing as an FSS coach, a little bit different, um, but it was someone that it turns out um, when they did their, it was a resident, and when they did their drug test, the person came back positive for marijuana. Now, this was a state where marijuana was legal um, and the person was using it recreationally. While well, the housing authority's policies were if anybody tested positive for any drug, they were automatically blacklisted and could never apply for another job with the housing authority again. Well, they went to um, the, the Jobs Plus coordinator, went to the HR specialist and said, look, like this is the person who we really need for our program to be able to connect with community and do this kind of outward, outreach. Um, and so eventually what they did is they set up, um, they changed their policy and they said um, that that person needed to go to drug treatment and have you know so many clean um, tests within a certain amount of time, et cetera. And they were able to hire that person and she was really, really great for the job. Um, so just kind of think about, you know, if you are thinking about hiring um, someone from, um, you know, from the community um, or someone who, you know, may, for whatever reason, um, just think about your background check policies and your drug check policies and see if they really make sense in order for you to hire the people that you really want. Um, so let's see, flipping over to, I think Eileen is going to talk about the action plans. Great. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about um, the action plan at a high level um, and wanted to talk about this in a bit more detail for as you're drafting your own. Um, there are some parts of the FSS program that are um, required by regulation, but other places where you have discretion and the action plan is where you um, define what you want to do on those aspects of the program where you have some choice about how you want to implement. Um, so some examples of these that are important to define in your action plan are your policies around interim disbursements, uh, whether you want to conduct any screenings for participants um, based on motivation, uh, whether you'll allow people to re-enroll in the program and any other policies around re-enrollments, um, the size of the program, whether you want to allow for changes in participant goals on their contract of participation, um, and how you want to allow for the use of forfeited escrow. Um, and as Anisi mentioned earlier, um, there are some 
guidance for best practices around these things. For example, it is a best practice to allow for goal changes in a COP. Um, and if you go to the FSS guidebook uh, that we've referenced previously, um, you'll find a lot of great detailed information on each of these items um, that can provide you with some guidance on best practices and um, things to consider as you're choosing how you want to implement each of these factors. And here are um, also some links to um, resources for the for um, creating your FSS action plan. Um, there's a checklist that you'll have to fill out um, and submit along with your draft action plan when you send those to your field office for approval. Um, and then we also have on the FSS resources page a sample FSS action plan that you can um, use as a kind of template as you're drafting your own. Um, we also have a webinar uh, that goes into more detail on creating your FSS action plan and the slides that correspond to that webinar are available as well. Um, so these are all links that will be in the, the slides from this presentation that you'll be able um, to access. Uh, or if you go onto the FSS resources page, you'll also um, be able to see all of those links. They're present on the website as well. And um, just a little note, here. Um, so HUD does, we did put together a sample FSS action plan. Um, we have had uh, every single FSS program had to redo its action plan after we um, published the new final rule and regulations back in 2022. So we reviewed over 900 action plans. Um, and I think our consensus is that we strongly recommend that you use the HUD sample action plan. It's not required. There are other sample action plans out there that you can get from TA providers, um, and some of them are great, but um, the HUD sample action plan is free, and we know for sure that it does, it, it hits all the requirements. Um, so check that out. Um, and then when you send it in, you also, you're required to send in the um, the checklist as well. Um, so yeah, just kind of wanted, wanted to mention that. Um, all right, so very, very quickly, looking at the time that we have, I'm gonna run through this, um, we strongly recommend a trauma-informed approach. Um, and I'm not going to really get into what trauma-informed care is. If you have never heard of it, um, there are actually two trainings on our website that are available. And I think we have links to them in here too, that talk about um, what trauma-informed care is and what a trauma-informed program design for FSS would look like. Um, so str strongly recommend that you take a look at that um, before you start kind of crafting your program design. Um, but basically what it does is understand that um, a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, not just poor people, not just people who are living in our housing, um, experience trauma as children. And that literally affects the way that our brains develop. Um, and the best thing that we can do for those folks is um, believe that that trauma happened, understand what the impacts of that trauma can be, and to design our programs to be um, responsive to that and not to re-traumatize. Um, too many of our current systems um, from police to hospitals to education systems um, to a lot of our housing systems end up just re-traumatizing and it's just not good for anyone. Um, so do do some research into the trauma-informed approach. There are a couple of kind of very high level um, uh, explanations of what that is. And then also we have those trainings that are available. Another thing to think about when you put together um, your program design is looking at um, the social determinants of health and really understanding that the families that you are working with are families that live in an environment and that live with other people, and that all of these um, factors will impact their well-being and their ability to actually be, quote unquote, self-sufficient, right? To um, find and maintain work, to be healthy, um, to help their kids to be successful. Um, you know, so all of when you're thinking about who your partners need to be, all of these um, systems um, should be at the table and represented because all of them are systems that your participants are going to be working with. Um, so um, some other things to think about, this is kind of a 201 uh, level, and this is in that program design um, training 
but um, really encourage you to make an outreach or marketing plan. Think about this like a you know your own separate program, um, which might mean branding. Um, you can call it something other than FSS. A lot of places call their programs really different things. If you're an existing program and you call your program something other than FSS, I'd love for you to put it in the chat. Some people call it you know Rise or Jumpstart or um, you know, or, or win or, you know, whatever, and reach goals, um, all those kind of things. Um, and it doesn't have to be called FSS at your agency at all. Um, some people brand it with, um, with colors. And so everything they do is in a neon green or one place has like a burnt orange. Um, and so every time they go, they walk through the neighborhood and they they put door hangers on, um, you know, somebody said, oh, I don't even need to see what those door hangers say. I know they're neon green. I know that um, the FSS program has been through the neighborhood. So thinking about that, um, think about uh, um, how you use your social media. Um, in the training, we get into a lot more about um, using social media. Um, just be very, very careful. Um, the worst thing you can do is create a page or a group on Facebook and then never check it and have people asking questions there that are never answered. The worst. So if you do use social media, make sure that you're using it responsibly and have somebody that's, um, you know, that is monitoring it um, and um, and aware. A lot of folks find that a text blast system is really helpful. There are free text blast um, software platforms out there that you can use. Um, so again, kind of all sorts of different ways to do um, outreach and marketing. Another thing that's really, really important is just talk to the people that you, you're you planning to serve. Find out how they like to receive information. If you had asked me 10 years ago how I wanted to receive information, I'd say send me an email. Today I'd say send me a text or Facebook instant message me. Um, also like I'm older now, um, I'm not on Snapchat. I don't do what the cool kids do. There's probably something left, you know, after Snapchat. I don't even know. But find out how people like to receive information. We've heard from so many um, PHAs who've been spending a lot of money, again, that's not covered by the grant, on postage and copies and come to find out none, nobody answers, you know, nobody opens their mail. Um, so have focus groups. Talk to people about um, what what mediums they want to see, what messages are working. Um, I also know that Compass Working Capital has done a ton of this work um, and um, they have a free level membership and also a paid level membership, but also just a ton of resources on their website um, about outreach and marketing and the, um, you know, the work that they've done that they found to be really successful. So that may be a place to look as well. Um, and also later on, we're going to, we have some links to a couple of different peer um, moderated uh, discussion groups. And that's a great place to talk to folks about like, what have you tried and, and um, what has worked? Um, so another, another couple of things to think about when you're launching your program are like, how will you utilize your program coordinating committee? Um, how will you incorporate residents on your um, program coordinating committee. It is actually a requirement of the program in the regulation to have at least one participant from each type of rental assistance that you are serving on your program coordinating committee. So if you serve public housing and vouchers and multifamily, you need three, um, uh, three representatives three resident representatives on your program coordinating committee. Now vouchers, like you don't need a separate one for VASH and EHV and um, you know, any all of the special purpose vouchers, just one from vouchers is fine. Um, so you're going to want to do sort of a general needs assessment, um, make sure that you have the right partners in place, um, figure out where your gaps are, and then be looking to go out and, and um, fill those gaps if you're, um, if, if that's possible. Um, so uh, we're going to, another thing to think about is actually having employers on your program coordinating committee. Um, people who have really bought into the program and are excited about it and want to, you know, hire folks or at least interview folks and things like that. Um, these are just some other best practices for collaboration. I'm going to move really quickly here because we've got a lot of questions that I want to be able to get to in the chat. So I'm going to um, send this over to, I think it's Jason, who's going to talk about kind of the foundational documents and where to find things. And uh, yeah. Eileen? No, it's Eileen. Sorry. Yes, no, that's all right. Um, I can go through these really quickly so we can get to the questions. Um, so first, one important document is the NOFO. Um, 
hopefully a lot of you have, are already familiar with this from the application process, but there's um, a lot of great information in there, especially about um, eligible activities and use of funds. Um, so that's a really great resource for you. Um, the grant agreement, which we discussed earlier, um, that'll be an attachment to your notice of award, and we'll also make that available uh, on the FSS resources page um, so that you'll be able to reference that. Um, FSS statute and regulations are also really important if you want to go back to see what is required by regulation um, for the FSS program. You can look through those. Um, you can find them online, and um, those are also specifically linked on the FSS resources page. Um, and another note about the, the resources page, many of you may be familiar with the FSS website already. Um, we are preparing to launch a new website um, that we're really excited about. We think that it'll be um, a lot easier to use and is designed uh, in a really nice way. So we're super excited to be putting that out soon. Um, but for now, the old website is still live and has all of these documents on there so that you can reference them. Um, and we'll definitely um, send out a lot of announcements once the new website um, is up and ready to be used. Uh, can we go to the, thank you. Um, here again are those resources for the FSS action plan that we discussed earlier. Um, the checklists that you'll need to submit in addition to your plan, our sample action plan, um, the webinar and webinar recording and slides um, about the FSS action plan. Um, we also have some resources related to the contract of participation. Um, we have the standard form, the 52650 up on the resource page. Uh, and if you look on HUD clips, you can find the contract of participation translated into 10 languages. So if you have residents who um, would prefer to see the contract in another language, um, you can check that out to see um, what options we have there as well. Then last, we have some resources on the FSS escrow. Um, accounting brief number 26 um, lays out in a lot of detail um, best practices around financial reporting for FSS. That's a really helpful resource. Um, PIH notice 2022-20 um, is also very helpful in answering questions you might have about escrow and forfeited escrow. We also have a webinar about um, the changes that were made to the regulations that covered the escrow in 2022. Um, and that's super helpful. It walks through the escrow calculation workbook, which we also have available on the FSS resources page um, and kind of talks you through how that workbook um, operates um, and how the escrow is calculated. Um, you can also find those workbooks. There's one for PHAs and one for PBRA owners also available on the FSS resources page. Sorry, I said last slide, but there was one more. Um, so just a quick note on reporting and monitoring. Um, right now, you may have heard already, we uh, sent out the survey for our first ever FSS annual report. Um, so we're collecting responses right now um, with qualitative information on how you all are running your FSS programs. Um, so if you ran an FSS program in calendar year 2023, um, then we ask that you send uh, in a response to that survey. Um, I can in a minute put a link in the chat again if you haven't submitted that response yet. Um, if you are a new grantee and haven't implemented FSS yet, um, then you don't need to worry about that until next year. Um, it's a Microsoft Forms link um, and should take no more than an hour to complete. Uh, also, some quick notes on FSS monitoring. Um, if you want to make sure that you're in compliance with um, FSS regulations, then you can do that by assessing for yourself. We have a tool available on the FSS resources page that uh, is the same as the one that HUD will use when formally monitoring your program. Um, so the links are here in the slides as well as on the FSS resources page. So you can take a look at that monitoring tool and make sure that your program is in compliance. Um, great. Yep. And that, um, so anybody can use that monitoring tool. Um, there will be some stuff like for new grantees, there will be some stuff on there that's just not applicable. Um, 
but you might want to look for, through it and just be like, oh, so this is what they'll eventually be looking at in terms of monitoring. And these are kind of metrics to be tracking to, to kind of look at, you know, how is my program doing? Um, great. So um, let's see, was, uh, Jason was going to do the PIH side of this, and I think Libby was going to do the uh, multifamily. Uh, sure. Happy to. I think this was you. And, and oh, sorry. Okay. So, um, for PHAs, there is a notice, um, PIH notice 2016-8, um, and there's a, um, a series of like six webinars that break down the notice and, um, slides for those webinars that are available on the FSS resources page. Page. They're also in the FAQ. Um, I'm going to recommend um, when you go to the FSS resources page that you look at the FAQ as one of the primary documents. Um, and uh, so that notice was a notice on like how to most effectively submit your 50058s um, to the PIC system. Now, somebody asked if um, the FSS coordinator would need access to PIC. The answer is not necessarily. If you've got somebody at your housing authority who does all the PIC uploads, that's fine. But um, the, the notice does kind of go through one of the things um, that we found is that if the FSS coordinator kind of um, gets all of the five eights ready for submission and then someone else submits them. Um, oftentimes what would happen is that they would get flags or errors and then never actually go back to the FSS coordinator. So the FSS coordinator would think everything was uploaded correctly, um, but PIC was not showing that. So um, it has some suggestions on, you know, how to look at that workflow human process at the housing authority and also a lot of very specific details about like this date must be before that date, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's got also a lot about porting in there and how you want to make sure that um, uh, kind of what, what, who would, who would um, report in PIC when someone um, ported and whether they were absorbed or um, or their voucher was administered, um, et cetera, et cetera. So do take a look at that. Again, that's only for public housing um, and it's about PIC. Um, as you know, on the public housing side, we'll be switching to the HIP system sometime this summer. So we will be updating that notice to talk about HIP in the future. But for right now, um, the 5058s, um, and it's for regular uh, um, PHAs, it's section 17 on the 5-8. And um, the way that we count your participants is whether there's an um, enrollment, a progress report, or an exit report during the calendar year. Um, that's how we um, count the number of participants that you get credit for. Um, on the multifamily side, it's different. And I'll turn it over to Libby to talk about that. So on the multifamily side, we previously had quarterly reports. We don't anymore. Um, honestly, you know, it was it was a lot of work to do quarterly reports, and the information just didn't change that much from quarter to quarter. So following the publication of the final rule in 2022, we switched to annual reporting to align with how things are done on the public housing side. We had paused reporting after our publication of the final rule and are now ready to restart. So you'll um, receive information from your account executive or resolution specialist on the due date for submission. You can also watch the multifamily um, gov delivery list if you subscribe to that, and I encourage you to do so um, for updates on that. And Anisi, I think we'll probably send out a notification on the FSS list as well, if you uh, are game, letting you yep. know when the due date for that submission will be. It's using the multifamily reporting tool, which is available already on the FSS page. While we haven't announced the due date yet, you absolutely can be working on, on that report. Um, and I would encourage you to, if you had uh, residents that were enrolled in 2023, um, or, you know, participants in 2023, then I would encourage you to be filling that out. Obviously, that's, you know, doesn't apply to those of you who are brand new grantees that are starting an FSS program for the first time. It'll be submitted to your account executive via the appropriate incoming box, just like you do with, you know, other servicing items. Uh, and 
this year, you know, really it's, um, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you fill out the reporting tool and submit it to the incoming box by the deadline, um, which is likely to be in, in near the end of March or in early April. We also are going to be publishing though, just as a, um, a heads up, we're looking to publish a new handbook chapter on FSS. We've never had one before on the multifamily side, but we, now that we have um, the program growing on the multifamily side, we're going to be publishing a handbook chapter in 2024. So please also be watching the multifamily drafting table if you are interested in reviewing and commenting on that handbook chapter in draft form. And you can find a link to the drafting table on the multifamily page on HUD.gov. And, oh yes, and in the annual survey, multifamily owners, please also answer the annual survey, um, just like public housing authorities. Great. Um, I am just looking. Uh, okay. Uh, what I'm going to do, um, Jason, not to steal your thunder, but I'm going to skip the FAM score right now and just encourage folks to take a look at the webinar um, on the FAM score, which will look at the the, um, the things, the metrics that we look at to try to compare apples to across programs. Um, new programs will not have a FAM score for at least uh, five to seven years. So it's something that you need to be worried about immediately, but it's just a good, it's good to know kind of what, what we're looking at, which is basically looking at graduations, um, um, participation uh, either at or over the minimum, and then also um, the increase in earned income. And there's a lot of specifics around what that looks like. Um, and uh, I want to also mention that we've got um, office hours every month. We send out the announcements about that on the FSS listserv. We usually have several hundred people that join us on those office hours hours. And sometimes we have sort of a topic that we go over, but a lot of times it's literally just two hours of kind of what we're going to do for the next 10 minutes of like, here's all the questions and here's all the answers. And um, so just a way to kind of be interactive and in getting those um, those questions answered. And uh, it's usually, I think the third Tuesday, um, I think the next one's going to be like tentatively scheduled for March 18th, but we'll send a, um, some information about that. Um, so folks have asked uh, where you can get training. We talked about that earlier. Um, this list is here. Again, these um, slides will be up on the website. This, there's also the same list as in the um, FAQ document. Um, this, these are not HUD endorsed, um, but these are just some places that we know that do do trainings. Um, also really important, some of these places will offer a certification. HUD does not require a certification. So if you wanna get one, that's fine, but um, uh, yeah, but, but we don't require one. Um, these are also, I mentioned the peer support, um, which are, these are two that we know about, um, where, um, FSS programs have come together. One is through NARO and the other is through Compass Working Capital. These are free sites where you can post questions. One is actually a listserv where, where um, emails show up in your email box um, and people ask questions and then answer them. And the other is um, it's a website, the Compass FSS link that has like a discussion board and where like you go there and you can ask questions and um and provide answers or get answers. Um, and on that discussion board, you can also look like historically to see um, what's been up there. So um, uh, again, not HUD endorsed, not HUD uh, supervised. Um, so always, you know, take everything with a little grain of salt if people are, uh, you know, unless people can show you the regulation or the the quote from where it's coming from. But generally, I think really, really good information and lots, it's a great place to talk about the best practices as well. Um, so these are the, um, uh, just some, some of the resources that we've been talking about. Big, big, big thing right here, especially if you don't get your, to your question today. Um, if you are in a PHA, um, send your questions to HUD at, to FSS at HUD.gov. If you are in a PBA owner, um, send your questions to MF underscore, there's an underscore there, MF underscore FSS at HUD.gov. 
um, and we will answer the questions um, that we don't get to today, but also check out that FAQ um, that we put in the chat. Um, so questions. Um, so I'm going to sort of, there's like 48 questions that we haven't answered. I'm going to go through them as quickly as possible um, and we'll see how far we get. So that um, the action plan is sent to your grant specialist or to your PMS in your field office. Um, oh, the grant agreements and notices of award are not available in grant solutions yet. We should have led with this. Um, for the renewals, we anticipate that those will be in grant solutions for you to go in and accept. And then it takes another like a couple of days to a week to actually get the money into locks. So we think that those will be in grant solutions to accept early next week. Um, and then for new awards, I think we're looking at probably the week after that, they will be there. But whoever it is, the AOR, the Authorized Organizational Representative um, that submitted your application will get a notification from the grant solution system that will say, please go into grant solutions and um, and accept this award. If your AOR has changed, like say your executive director, when you submitted the application, you know, left and you have a new one, um, you can send a message to fss.hud.gov and um, say who uh, your um, your uh, agency name and the, the new AOR's name and email and position title, and um, we can get that changed for you. Um, so, um, how do you enroll participants in FSS? That's a great, very basic question. Um, you have to, they have to fill out a contract of participation, um, on the public housing side, um, that then is counted by putting, by filling out the 50058 section 17 for standard PHAs or section 23 for MTW original 39 or MTW expansion PHAs, um, and for multifamily, you would just record that on your annual um, your annual report. But basically, the um, signing the contract of participation is what constitutes an enrollment. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, Libby, does the program have its own grant specialists? Or are they the same as those who answer who um, handle multifamily service coordinator grants? For the most part, it's going to be the same as the grant specialist who handles the service coordinator grants. Those are assigned by the state where the property is located. However, with FSS, um, if you're located in the Northeast, right now we're going to be having one grant specialist handling all uh, FSS grantees on the multifamily side. Um, if some other regions may also adjust the workload to even things out, um, but uh, for the most part, it will be your usual grant specialist if you have a service coordinator grant. Um, and regardless, you can always email uh, either your grants mailbox in your region or your grant specialist, and they will point you to the right door if uh, your grant is being handled by someone else. Great, thank you. Um, also, we just wanna be very clear. So we're talking about the FY23 grants. Those are the grants that are being, that we just made, that you'll be accepting now. The FY23 grants, um, we call them FY23 because they were appropriations that came in the FY23 budget, but the FY23 grants are used in calendar year 24. So that may be a little bit confusing when we're talking about 23 and 24, but right now you're getting ready to use the FY23 money for the program year of calendar year 24. A um, couple questions about if you already had a voluntary program, you were running um, or maybe an unfunded program, you were running an FSS program um, and now you're a new grantee, can you count the people who were already in your program? The answer is yes. When we're talking about um, serving 25 people in that first year, it can be anyone with an enrollment, a progress, or an exit report. So if you already have people in the program and they have a progress report this year, um, they would count. You don't have to enroll 25 new people. Um, so, and then if you if you um, all already have an FSS action plan that's been approved by HUD, you don't have to submit a new one. 
um, that old one will suffice. You can update it if you would like to, and you would do it the same way by submitting it to your field office or your grant specialist, but you don't have to. Um, let's see. Um, does the FSS coordinator need access to pick? Um, the answer is uh, probably not. Um, it would be whoever at your office does pick already um, can continue to handle that. Um, does the FSS coordinator handle most of the accounting of the escrow accounts? Um, in most cases, the FSS coordinator will do the escrow calculation. Um, and then it's really up to however your um, housing and rental software works, um, sort of who would input that and where. So um, that's really kind of up to you locally. It may also be that the housing specialist does the um, escrow calculation. Um, but again, uh, the FSS coordinator would still be kind of responsible for overseeing that and making sure that it was correct. Um, if you got a grant this year, you can serve, if you're at a PHA, you can serve public housing um, and vouch and or vouchers and or project-based rental assistance. So it's all one grant program and any grantee can serve any of that type of um, rental assistance if you have it under your purview or have a, um, a cooperation agreement with another entity. Um, let's see. Um, if anybody else is looking and wants to jump in, please feel free. Um, how much of this job do you think a coordinator can do effectively via Zoom only? So really interesting question. Um, there are some statewide agencies that um, kind of serve people uh, with vouchers all over the state and only have a few coordinators. And so they may only actually see their participants like once every six months, once a year. Um, the key is, uh, especially during COVID, like with all of us, we found that there's the um, virtual coaching can be really, really successful. However, you do have to know who the service providers are in that person's area. So that would be the really challenging thing to do things um, to to serve folks who are far away. Um, but um, it's, you know, I, I would also encourage some in-person meetings at the beginning, at least, to, to like establish the contract and set the ITSP, and maybe quite right at the beginning. Um, but um, a lot of agencies have set up, um, you know, text tickler systems, um, uh, you know, Facebook instant message, the FaceTime that, you know, you can have a lot of contacts that aren't that uh, forcing the participant to like get on a bus and come to your office, right? So use all of those social media tools the same way that they're used with us. Send reminders. I mean, I have, my kid has a doctor's appointment and I must have gotten three reminders in the past week that, that, that they have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Um, we should be using those same kind of tools, um, you know, with, with our programs as well. Um, can a cell phone be an eligible expense if categorized as fringe? So if everyone in your agency gets a cell phone for their work or, or like people who are doing public facing work like this get a cell phone, um, then that's, then yes, that could be considered fringe. But in most cases, that would be an admin, um, activity. Um, you might have a cell phone stipend um, that could be considered fringe as well. Like if somebody has to use their personal cell phone and they're given a stipend each month to cover some of the data um, that they're using, that that's a possibility. Um, let's see. Uh... Does the action plan require board approval? So um, uh, in the regulations um, outside of FSS, there's something um, called that basically says if any of a document like an action plan is a significant amendment, um, then it does require board approval, but it's up to you and your, lo your locality to decide whether an FSS action plan is a, is a significant amendment and um, would require board approval. And that um, there's more information on that in the webinar about um, doing the action plans. Um, uh, can training for FSS coordinators be paid with forfeitures? The answer is yes, that is an eligible activity. However, since training is available as a um, 
as a fringe benefit. Um, really, the intent of those FSS forfeitures is to be used um, for the benefit of uh, FSS families in good standing. And there's a whole section in the guidebook um, and in the training about kind of eligible uses of, um, of those forfeitures. Um, so let's see, good coach to clients ratio, I'd say again, um, 50 to one or one to 50 generally, but again, I've seen really, really great programs uh, be even a little bit bigger than that. Um, for the FSS coordinator, is there any place to keep all case notes for the monthly check-in? So first of all, they don't have to be monthly. They can be, but it's not necessarily a best practice to see everyone every month. And the answer is, um, I would strongly suggest if you have the resources to invest in a case management tracking system, there are a lot of them out there. Some are more expensive than others. Um, HUD does not provide a case management tracking system. Um, deposits into escrow accounts must accrue interest. Yes, they must. Regulatorily, they must be in an interest-bearing account. Um, when creating a participant's file, what documents are required or strongly recommended? So actually, if you look at the um, self-assessment checklist for the monitoring reviews, the last page of it is um, a suggested list for what should be in participants' files. Um, let's see. We are over four o'clock. Team, did you see anything in here that needs, uh, that like is glaring? Um, it needs to be answered before we go. Just that I think, you know, we've talked about, we do have the regular office hours and, uh, you know, I think we've been thinking about um, doing some special office hours for new grantees so that this won't be your only chance to um, ask questions and, and talk with us and would certainly um, encourage you all to continue to stay engaged and uh, hope to see you, you know, at all of our future events. Um, yes, absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. We got to almost all of these. Um, so if I missed you and you've got something that's really critical, send the message to FSS at HUD.gov. Um, I'm just going to let you know, I am actually going to be out for the next week and a half. Um, and I normally, uh, sort of cover the mailbox. So uh, we are going to have coverage, but I usually try to respond within 24 hours and may take folks a little bit longer. So I do apologize in advance um, on that. Oh, one other question about what happens if the federal shutdown happens. As you know, we're waiting to get a budget. We're supposed to um, have a budget by March 1st. Um, if we don't, we get shut down. Um, and so if you have already accepted your grant in Grant Solutions and gotten your money in locks, then you can still spend it. Um, but the chances of that happening before the end of this week are probably slim to none. Um, so what that would mean is that you would not have access to, like the processes that would get you access to your funding would halt. Um, so the way it works in general, though, is once you do have, like if you're a renewal and you've already gotten your money, um, then you actually, no renewals have gotten their money. But say this were to be happening later in the year, you have your money. Once you have your money, you can spend it regardless of whether, um, you know, we are employed at HUD or not. Um, but um, we are non-essential. Um, all, all of us who work on this program are non-essential. And so we would be furloughed and all the processes on this um, would stop if we end up, if the government ends up shutting down, unfortunately. Um, all right, so I'm gonna stop here. Thank you for hanging in for a couple extra minutes. Really appreciate it. Um, so much more information. So anyway, check out the guidebook, the FAQ, the training once it gets posted um, and come to the office hours you know, all of those things. And, um, and we will be in touch very soon. So thank you all. Thank you, Michelle, for um, handling all of the tech end. No problem. Thank you everyone for joining today's conference and thank you for using event services. Your conference has ended and you may disconnect.